optically pump magnetometers are very interesting instruments and we're going to talk about them. We're going to take a look at using the Heisenberg energy time uncertainty principle to get an estimate of the sensitivity of the optically pumped magnetometer. So in other words, we're going to come up with something to give us an estimate for delta B. We're going to do this in three parts. We might add a fourth part later. But on part one, we're going to talk about the helium-4 energy levels because we're going to concentrate on a helium-4 optically pumped magnetometer. In part two, we'll talk about an ac actual system. And in part three, we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues associated with using Heisenberg energy time uncertainty principle. This is a photograph of a friend of mine, Don King, and we worked for years together on optically pumped magnetometers. He was born the same year I was, and we lost him a number of years ago. And we worked a lot together on the ANSQ 81V2 magnetometer and on some very interesting things that went beyond that. So okay, in part one now, we want to talk about the energy levels. And this is a little complicated, but it's also not, not too complicated. You have to realize that helium actually exists in two states. One's called the parahelium singlet state, and the other one is the orthohelium triplet state. If you have a balloon filled with helium, you would, those helium atoms would exist in this one, one S0 state, singlet state. And they're not of much use. To get them useful, we have to get them into a metastable state, the two triplet S1 state. And to get from the helium ground state to the triplet state in orthohelium, it turns out that quantum laws forbid that through some sort of interaction with light. So the only way to get there, well, the, the way to get there is through non-radiative transitions. And what that means is we will apply a discharge to a helium cell. Uh, we might get a cosmic ray going through, get some ionization, and then with uh, alternating voltage on the cell, we'll have the helium atoms banging into one another, and we'll eventually get a lot of the helium atoms into the two triplet S1 state. And we want to get there because in a magnetic field, what I'm showing over here with the magnetic quantum numbers m equals minus 1, 0, and plus 1, the line for the two triple S1 state gets split. So we have three lines over here. Now the optical pumping part comes about. Above the two triple S1 state, there's a number of states, but we're just going to show the two triple P0. And if we shine light onto these metastable atoms in this level, they will go up to the two triplet P0 state and then fall back down. And this process of going up and back down, we can change the population of the levels over here, and that is what is called the optical pumping process. And I'm showing here the energy level here is 1.1. 146 EV, and that corresponds to this wavelength of light. And down here, it was 9.82 getting from the ground state in the singlet state to the triplet state. And if that was a radiative transition, I just want to indicate it to you that the wavelength would be 62 nanometers, which puts it, in, it puts it into the extreme ultraviolet. But as I said, it's a non-radiative transition, so we rely on the collisions of the helium atoms in the cell to get to this level. And in the magnetic field, over on this side, the field is zero. Over on this side, we have an increasing field, and we're taking as an example 50,000 nanoteslas. So the lines get split, and there's a certain energy level difference here. And for the value of 50,000 nanoteslas, that works out to 5.8 nano electron volts, which is almost no energy at all. But it's good enough to make a magnetometer work. Now, to get into more of the details of this, we'll come down to this level, this diagram here. Again, I'm showing the line split. 
I indicated before what the wavelengths of the transitions were and the energy level. So this energy level here of 5.8 nanoelectron volts when the field is 50,000 nanoteslas, if you convert using Planck's equation, E equals H nu, you would find that this, that the frequency would be 1.4 megahertz corresponding to 212 meters in, in wavelength. So again, it's a very small amount of energy difference. And the, there, is a there is a correspondence between the field and this frequency. The field controls the spacing. The transition between here represents that frequency. And the frequency is equal to gamma B. B is the magnetic field. Gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio. And for helium, that's 28.024 hertz per nanotesla. So if you're in a field of 50 nanoteslas, which we're showing here, 50 nanoteslas times that gives us the 1.4 megahertz, which is the frequency of this transition, which results in a wavelength of 214 meters, which is sort of an odd way of expressing that, but it is 5.8 nano electron volts. And so you can use that frequency to figure out the wavelength, which is the 214 we mentioned, and then also the energy using that frequency that we get from gamma times B, sticking it in here for the Planck's law, we get the 5.8 nano electron volts. Now to explain this in more detail, we're going to take a snippet of this area right here and we're going to draw it over here. So these are the three levels and I've just stretched them out because I want to show you something. Now once the atoms are in the two triplet S1 state, we'll have a distribution in these three levels. The m equals minus one, m equals zero, m equals plus one. And the normal Boltzmann distribution makes it equal. So we're just going to say, for argument purposes, that we have two at that level, two at this level, two at this level. So going back here, we have two atoms at this level, we have two atoms at this level, and we have two there. And they would just stay that way as long as we had the uh, decent population of the metastable helium atoms. Now what we're going to do though, we're going to shine the light representing the pumping light. The 1.80 microns or 1,082 nanometer light. And we're going to polarize that light in a certain way. We can make it right hand, circularly polarized or, or left, but we're going to take the example of right hand. And that what that will do, it will take the atoms in this level, bounce them up to the, if you come back here, it'll take you back up to this level, and they will fall back down. Now when they fall back down, they have, so we take them out of this level, they're all the way up at the two triplet P0, they're going to fall back down. Anytime they fall back down here, they're going to get bounced back up. So after a while, we have a distribution that looks like this. That is a pump state. We took the atoms in this level through the pumping light, got them up to the two trip of P0. They fall back down, fall back down with equal probability into any of these three levels, but every time they fall back down in here, they get bounced up, so eventually we wind up with a pump state due to the pumping light. Now, if we apply this frequency that we talked about over here for the 50,000 nanoteslas, the 1.4 megahertz, so now we have this cell we shined light on it, the pumping light. We got atoms into this state. Now if we apply the 1.4 megahertz to this, 
we can scramble this all up again. And so we'll go from that down to here. And the pumping light is still on. But we're scrambling it up with this frequency, so we basically get a distribution that looks like this. And the pumping light is working on these, sending them back up. They're coming back down. And when they fall here, they, the, some of the pumping light gets absorbed, and they go back up. So now j just imagine that we're going to start at a frequency little lower than this. What would the light intensity look like? Well, initially, we have this condition from the pumping light. And we're not tuned into this energy spacing yet. So what will happen will be that the light will come through. So we have basically a high intensity of light coming through. As we approach this frequency, we're applying it to try to scramble these up. We'll notice a dip in the light. And when we're right on this frequency, we'll get the biggest dip in the light. And then when we move to higher frequencies, it will go back up and look like that. And that is a resonance signal. And what I'm showing up here is part of the way the magnetometer works. Now let's imagine that instead of just scanning across with that frequency from something less than 1.4 megahertz to something higher, let's suppose we get close to the resonance and we're going to scan the frequency back and forth. And let's say we're a little bit on this side of the peak in the absorption of the, of the light what will we get out? We'll get a curve that looks like this. If we're on the upper side, we put this in and we get this out. And you notice there's a difference in the phase of these two signals. So we know we're on the high side. And then if we come back down and we're exactly in right on the Goldilocks mark, then we get a signal that looks like this. And so using a process like this, which I'll talk about when we talk more about the system, that's how we get the, magnet, the system to lock on to a resonance peak. And so as the magnetic field changes going higher or lower, the resonance frequency will follow it. We convert the resonance frequency to a change in magnetic field. And that's how the magnetometer works in a very simple sense. Now, we want to talk about the, using the uncertainty principle. So if we come over here, we have delta E. Delta T is greater than or equal to H bar over 2. That's the Heisenberg energy time uncertainty principle. Now one of the other equations that we need, we showed earlier, and that's Planck's law, E equals H nu. So we have E is equal to H nu. And then that frequency nu, which corresponds to the 1.4 megahertz over here, that is related to the magnetic field through that equation we talked about, gamma b. So what we can do, we can say delta E is equal to H delta nu. And then we can say that delta nu here is equal to gamma delta b. And if we put this together, we have here delta E is equal to H gamma delta B. And delta B is what we're after. That's going to be an estimate of our sensitivity. And if we go to here, what do we use for delta T? And what we use for delta T is the lifetime in those states. So we're going to call that tau, lifetime tau. So now we have delta E equals H gamma delta B. If we put that in for delta E, we'll have H gamma delta B tau. And that's greater than or equal to H bar over 2. H bar is H over 2 pi. so h bar over 2 
is h over 4 pi. And we can now solve for delta b. And if we do that, the h's cancel out. And we get 1 over 4 pi gamma tau. So we get that as an estimate of the magnetometer sensitivity. How accurate is that? Well, one of the things you have to consider is when you do use a Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and most people are familiar with the one involving momentum and position. When you say that's greater than or equal to h bar over 2, that is for simultaneous measurements. You have to measure delta x and delta px simultaneously for the uncertainty principle. We're not measuring tau. So our estimate here is uh, a little bit on, on the high side. So if we put in, we have 1 over 4 pi. We used gamma as 28.024 hertz per nanotesla. So we'll just put 28, say, for gamma. And tau is roughly 10 to the minus 2 seconds. All the units will work out to magnetic field because we got 28.024 hertz per nanotesla. And we're multiplying by seconds. The time cancels out bring the nanoteslas up and the answer is in nanoteslas. And so roughly speaking, we have uh, 4 pi 12, say roughly 10, 28, 10 to the minus 2. That's roughly one-third nanotesla. That magnetometer is, of course, much better than that, but one of the reasons that it is much better is because of what I said earlier. We are not measuring the lifetime at the same time that we're trying to measure the field. But still, this is a pretty good number. So that was the goal of this part, of part one, was to come up with this expression. <laughs>